1847, us Mormons came into this valley of the Great Salt Lake to settle in isolation. We tried to become a state in 1850, but obtained territorial status instead. In the Compromise of 1850, it was decided that California would join the Union as a free state. And the large territories of Utah and New Mexico would practice popular sovereignty, meaning they could choose their slave status. Utah chose to be a slave territory. During the next 10 years, sectionalism ran rampant throughout the nation, dividing the lines between slavery and free soil. In 1854, the nation again allowed territories popular sovereignty. The Kansas-Nebraska Act brought Nebraska in as a free territory. Kansas could not decide, went to war with itself. Slave states kept threatening to lead a union. And the federal reported officials in Utah were finding that Governor Brigham Young had all the power. They had none. These runaway officials left for Washington, D.C. in frustration a couple of months later to tell lies and exaggerations to the president. In 1856, Judge Drummond was assigned to the territory. And he brought with him his beautiful wife, or so we thought. Judge William Drummond came to Utah with his beautiful mistress, and the Mormons pushed him out. He left angry and vowed revenge. He told President Buchanan exaggerated lies about the Mormons' lawlessness. He reported of imagined uprisings in the territory, so President Buchanan decided to replace Brigham Young as governor. Worried that the Mormons would not allow a new governor to step in, he sent 2,500 of us to Utah to put down the rebellion and to facilitate the exchange. Leaving Kansas, we marched a thousand miles across plains and mountains. The Mormons gathered 5,000 militiamen in response to our threat. Winter and the Mormons stopped us in Wyoming. Temperatures plummeted and our army disintegrated while 3,000 of our livestock died from cold and starvation. While we never saw the Mormon militia in battle, they destroyed 300,000 pounds of our food. An agreement was reached when Thomas L. Kane, a man from Washington, intervened and the Mormons finally stepped down. We were forced to hold back our anger towards the Mormons as we entered the Salt Lake Valley. Not allowed to settle near Salt Lake City, we had to march 50 miles to the southwest to set up camp. We finally reached Cedar Valley and set up Camp Floyd. When we entered the territory, the Mormons realized that they no longer had full control. We became the powerful enforcers of the federal officials' ruling. These officials would run away no more. When Albert Sidney Johnston led his army into Utah in 1858, he found no Mormons uprising. So this became known as Buchanan's blunder. Both his army and Camp Floyd are symbols of stronger federal authority and of the national hatred towards Mormons. The camp is over 110 acres and has the most soldiers of any military fort in the United States. It has about 350 buildings, with the main street being a half mile long. Most of these buildings are adobe, constructed from bricks made by the Mormons and sold to the army for a penny each. These soldiers are mostly foreign-born Americans from Germany, Italy, Ireland, Scandinavia, Mexico, and a handful of African descendants. The military buys some supplies from the Mormons, but brings most of what they need from the East. Since we've been here, 9,000 wagons have shipped out 10 million pounds of supplies. Life in camp is boring. One of our soldiers said that the history of a day was the history of a year. The elements exact a heavy toll, causing us to suffer constantly. Winters are very cold, and summers are very hot. Dust is a constant irritant from both the wind and the dirt floors in our buildings. Desertion runs rampant, while boredom turns into heavy drinking, which is seen as an absolute necessity. 
Both the locally made alcohol drink and the camp's local newspaper share the name of Valley Tan. While opening a new road to California, Captain James Simpson named several places after soldiers along the way, such as Simpson Springs. Under Johnston's protection, Mormon John Carson modified his home to become the Stagecoach Inn. It is now a major stopover for the Overland Stage. It also provides welcome sanctuary to many of our officers. Established in 1860, the Pony Express follows the Stagecoach Road. Its route comes right through Salt Lake City and Camp Floyd, connecting us with the outside world. While the soldiers find that there is no real Mormon problem to deal with, the same cannot be said about the Native Americans. Skirmishes with the local Utes, Paiutes, Goshutes, and Shoshone provided one of their few diversions. Utah's first Masonic Lodge, the Rocky Mountain Lodge 205, was established at Camp Floyd by soldiers and officers stationed here. They continually help destitute emigrants financially as they go further west. Plays are enacted upon stage, many making playful jabs at the local Mormons. Some soldiers started a German-speaking club, and the circus occasionally comes to town. Buchanan's blunder will cost the U.S. government millions of dollars. At its height, Camp Floyd boasted 3,500 soldiers to control the Mormons. Even though it wouldn't last, they made their presence known. For good or for bad, this military action has affected every aspect of our lives. Around 7,000 people live in the camp and the surrounding civilian area of Fairfield, making it the third largest city in the Utah Territory. Fairfield, also known as Frogtown, is dominated by gambling, and to us, it is a den of vipers. Surrounding the buildings of Frogtown are scores of canvas-covered shacks, wagon box huts, and dugouts. Their violence and crime spill out into the rest of the territory. It invades our lives and disrupts our dreams of Zion. This is one of the reasons that Brigham Young commanded the military to establish their camp so far from Salt Lake City. Instead of bringing us to our knees, Camp Floyd became our economic salvation because the Army brought desperately needed money to Utah. We sell food and supplies to the soldiers and hire out as workers. The camp was named for Secretary of War John B. Floyd. Since Mr. Floyd is a Southerner who joined the Confederacy, the name was changed to Camp Crittenden for a Kentucky Senator. This last April of 1861, the Army received orders to abandon Camp Floyd and returned to the east to stop the South from rebelling. The soldiers held an auction to sell off the supplies they could not take with them. We bought $4 million in supplies for only $100,000. It was our turn to beat Washington. Within weeks, Camp Floyd and Frogtown were gone. Confederate General Henry Heath and Union General John Buford were among the many soldiers who served at Camp Floyd and went on to distinguish themselves as key participants in the Civil War. Over the years, Sagebrush reclaimed the land and the government opened it up for homesteading. The Stagecoach Inn remained in operation until 1947 when it fell into disrepair. It was refurbished and opened as a state park in 1964. The commissary is considered to be the only military building remaining and now serves as the museum. The Camp Floyd Stagecoach Inn State Park and Museum interprets and preserves this national history for future generations. Today, only two or three lonely buildings remain amid a sprinkling of modern construction, belying the great prominence that they once had. Besides a few local residents, only the ghosts and the vague memories of a forgotten past remain. <laughs>